OK, so again, good afternoon, everyone. This is our second session of the day, and um, it's entitled Into the Digiverse. Digiverse, I kind of like saying that. Bringing everyone into accessibility and inclusive design. And we have on with us Tiffany Reardon, who is our newest addition to Galileo. And uh, she comes in as the program coordinator for Affordable Learning Georgia. She previously was at Kennesaw State where she did a lot of work with OER and even some of the leading, some of the grant activity around uh, grants that Affordable Learning Georgia has with this textbook transformation grant. And so we're glad to have Tiffany on the team. And then we also have Jeff Gallant who became the, who was program manager for Affordable Learning Georgia, but became the program director um, sometime last year. And so they are both here to discuss with us uh, some of the ways and initiatives that they have and ideas for making sure everyone is, um, can use accessible options for their libraries and educational materials. So I'll just give it over to you guys now. Thank you. Thanks so much. Um, I'll uh, get the presentation started. Uh, what we're going to do is kind of set up where we were um, when we first got started with Affordable Learning Georgia and then move into what we are planning in uh, planning for now and what we're looking at in the future, along with kind of the overall narrative and how that's shaped. And this is all uh, especially thanks to Tiffany, who um, was the primary author for these slides. So we got started in 2013 with a little pilot team, if you know the history of uh, Affordable Learning Georgia, and then we got funded in 2014 and immediately got started. We had as one of our kind of tentpole ideas running a, a series of grants that would enable faculty and librarians and instructional designers to take a little bit of time and work together to mostly adopt the OER that were already out there, OER being open educational resources uh, that are available for free for students uh, and for anyone globally, and also enable things like remixing and revising through permissions that are given out. Um, we thought that, well, there's plenty of resources that are just out there, and uh, the first people who are going to take these grants, they're going to probably just bring them into their class. They're going to uh, revise their course a little bit and then they'll see how it goes. But that didn't happen at all. There was a ton of resource creation just from the start. And so because of that, we had to do things like create a repository. Um, we had no idea that we'd be hosting all of these newly created materials right at the beginning. And as soon as we figured out, yeah, we have to host these things, we now knew that accessibility was a charge. We had to present all of these learning resources to the world, and we really wanted to make sure that at least at some sort of baseline, they were accessible. But because we operated from the idea of enabling and educating uh, faculty and librarians and instructional designers, to get this stuff done as their own teams, um, what we did was we paired up with the accessibility organization uh, that is associated with the USG, AMAC, which is now CIDI, and they would teach some accessibility stuff at each kickoff meeting. Our thing was we were not accessibility experts. We, we were librarians. We thought accessibility was important, but we saw it as this very complicated legal thing that needed uh, some education, but also you know, we were not the authorities on it. We couldn't just uh, from the top down say you must do things this way. Um, the way that we thought that this would work is that, OK, there is accessibility training for these original teams. Uh, then they can plan their projects their own way and bring them to us and they've already had accessibility training. The stuff that will come in is accessible and boom, it's all done. Um, that didn't really happen. We got a lot of materials that were very inaccessible and we had to fix a lot of stuff behind the scenes 
um, as we received these materials. And even then, they were still pretty inaccessible. We just at least got some heading structures in uh, to some of these and uh, you know, fixed the color contrast on a few. And in 2016, a really big event happens. UC Berkeley removed 20,000 uh, audiovisual files from iTunes U. They were famous in the OER world for providing so many educational materials, uh, video lectures and stuff like that. Uh, and they just said, well, you know, the Department of Justice gave us the directive to make all these files accessible and it's too expensive, so we're not going to do it. And we did not want this to happen to the materials that we now had to provide access to. This would be the opposite of the overall strategy of Affordable Learning Georgia, getting those free and open resources out there and making them uh, as accessible as possible. So we wanted to make sure that everything that we had at least complied with those rules. So from 2016 to 2020, uh, which is kind of the repository years, the, the first uh, phase of hosting all of these materials centrally, uh, we did what a lot of system office organizations would do. We would partner up with other organizations that were more capable of helping on this than we were. So again, we partnered with uh, AMAC and CIDI, but this time in a more proactive role. Um, all of the files that were considered textbooks were now going to be audited and uh, fixed for accessibility purposes. And just working out this partnership took a while. As you might imagine, it we already had a pre-existing partnership with uh, AMAC at the time. Also, the USG created AMAC before all of this existed. Now they're over at Georgia Tech. So there's a lot of complexities that happened and the partnership didn't really get underway until maybe late 2017, early 2018. Uh, at that point, they did some baseline accessibility fixes. So every file was at least um, readable by a screen reader in some fashion. Uh, they had OCR to the PDF files that we had, but a lot of the more major accessibility fixes were not things that they were able to do um, with this kind of small arrangement. Uh, some of the fonts, for example, were not very easy to read. Uh, there were some uh, documents that just kind of read like a series of words that went on forever without a heading structure. Uh, there was some stuff that we converted from a web page to kind of preserve um, these as an open textbook just in case the website happened to go away. And those web elements kind of stuck around and it was really hard to get those out. So the this period of time for us was one where we started to comply with the legal uh, requirements of things like the uh, ADA and Section 508, but this was not necessarily a proactive production first approach. We could do a lot better than this. And this was kind of part of the overall accessibility narrative back then. Uh, there were some people who were really uh, shouting from the rooftops about universal design for learning. Uh, I heard a lot of great stuff coming out of Canada on this especially, but uh, for us it just seemed like a legal thing that we absolutely needed to meet. We knew we had to make sure that we were not discriminating between different types of learners, but at the same time it was such a gigantic scale uh, compared to what we had to offer here at ALG. Um, so we were retrofitting materials that were already uh, somewhat inaccessible and hoping that this baseline accessibility would help. Um, and this was kind of what was going on in the higher education world writ large. The idea of accessibility needs to be addressed when a student identifies that they have a disability and then disability services goes and makes a new accessible version of it or acquires it from a publisher. Uh, it's an overall idea of accessibility being compliance, a, a legal thing. You got to leave it to people who know what they're doing. Uh, law stuff is really scary. Um, there's that means that 
the expectations for people who do accessibility are kind of unreasonable that everybody needs to be not only uh, well versed in every single screen reader that exists and uh, you know an expert on color contrast design but also somebody who knows the laws back and forth um, and the tutorials that were out there tended to be worded for either legal experts or technology experts. There wasn't much out there for faculty authors or um, for librarians for that matter. So we were kind of going along with this. We were trying to reach out to the experts as much as we could, and that was about all we could do at the time. But I'm going to uh, move this over to Tiffany to talk about our new plans and how um, well, basically, we hired Tiffany in February, and those new plans are are taking effect because of her and uh, her work. So I'm going to uh, transfer this over to you. Thanks. Um, so that's that. That's what the narrative was and has been. Um, but in the in, in the recent years, um, there have been shifts in the narrative in general, and really in all of education. Um, it, we're starting to look at it a little bit differently. Um, and so for one, we're moving from that reactive, um, like we only do it when a student identifies, um, moving from that process to more of, okay, let's try to do this ahead of time because these accessibility features benefit more than just students with disabilities. They benefit all students. And so, um, we moved from this reacting to an unexpected legal need, okay, design your course and suddenly there's the student who can't access any of your materials and you have to redesign all of it. We've moved from that to more of a, okay, let's design from the beginning for all students to access this course. And it that extends to the materials that they're using. Um, and so, the idea is to reach all students regardless of ability. Um, and it's also to kind of increase that engagement and um, uh, I guess ways to interact with the course. So we move to this accessibility inclusion um, sort of narrative. It's more, it's less about let's accommodate and more about let's just make it work for everyone. Let's not worry about accommodating. Let's make it work for everyone. And so with that particular shift, um, we've done a few things at ALG. So um, for one, um, they hired me as an instructional designer um, with accessibility experience. Um, and we started thinking up, I guess, ways to make access accessibility happen in ALG, in our materials and in uh, what we do with the different institutions. Um, and so one of the first ways that we've been doing that is we're playing catch up with um, the materials we already have. So we're going into everything we have and we're uh, applying accessibility to them retroactively. Um, there are three ways we're doing that. Some of them I am doing um, in most of those are the ones that don't really require too much um edits but then we have some that needed a little bit more or that needed a little bit more specialized design um and so with uh we have 16 books from the university of north georgia press that um they are redesigning um for word and and making accessible in the process putting in those heading structure most of their books um actually are mostly accessible already, um, but they are in a, uh, a format that isn't compatible with the system that we're moving into, uh, Manifold. And so we need those accessible Word versions. So that's what they're doing. Um, and then the Center for Inclusive Design Innovation, so previously AMAC, what Jeff was talking about, um, we have um, we're having them do some of the more like STEM specialized books that really need a lot of like alternative text and maybe um, SME input, uh, subject matter expert input, um, because of the, the, the content in it and, and my inability to um, do that effectively, um, not being a STEM expert. <laughs> so, um, 
so that's kind of the first thing we're doing is we're trying to go through everything we already have and we're trying to make it accessible. But then from there, we're also doing training materials um, to change what happens as we move forward. So instead of having to continue doing retroactive accessibility, we want to change the way that the materials we get are coming in. We want to make them accessible before they come into us. And so one of the ways that we're doing that is we are providing training materials um, for the faculty and librarians who are developing these OER. So, um, but they're specifically designed for those people. They're not designed for the accessibility expert. They're not designed for the lawyer. Um, we've created tutorials um, that are separated by type of accessibility or by component. And, um, and they are very stripped down to what you really need to know, um, how to do it easily, and um, uh, let's see, I guess where to go, I guess where to get started. Um, and so those are on our website, they're on the ALG website. Um, I probably should put a link in here, but I didn't. So um, Jeff, maybe you can put that. Oh, hey, you already did. Yep, it's in the chat. Stay ahead of me. Anyway, um, so, but the other thing we have, so we've revised the training that um, we've asked CIDI to do. Um, so they, they've been doing these presentations and educating on um, accessibility, but um, instead of having them do a, a longer sort of like, let's put as much information as we can into these two hours um, session and then leaving nothing afterwards. Um, instead, we've sort of, we've asked them to condense a little bit, focus on the why and the, the what, um, so that then the faculty leaving our grants kickoff meetings can then reference the materials and sort of get more uh, involved with them. They don't feel like they have to take extensive notes at kickoff and, and remember everything that happened there. Um, the other thing that we're getting ready to do is um, we are going to um, add a new requirement on our textbook transformation grants that uh, new materials being developed. So uh, if they are creating something new for their course or if they are um, creating a new revision of something um, that they must be developed with specific accessibility standards in mind. So this is going to be, we haven't written it yet, but this change is going to be a very um, guided change. So we're going to tell them exactly what standards we're looking for um, instead of just kind of saying, well, it must, must be accessible. Well, what does that mean? So we're going to outline specific things that we want from them and give them resources to make that happen. Um, yes, though the standards that, that we're going to be looking for are going to be what's what uh, what are in those tutorials on the website. So that's what we're doing as far as moving from reactive to proactive. But then there was also this shift in the narrative from sort of the like negative threat narrative of like uh, uh, relying on the threat of lawsuit to motivate teachers and librarians to become experts. We're, it, it's moved more into a positive, like, let's not really worry, let's not talk about the legal, let's talk about what this accessibility is going to do for your students, all of your students. And so, um, and with that, institutions are adding more uh, instructional design support, training, things like that. So it's more support and it's more uh, student centered and less like, let's not get sued. Um, and so with that, some of that overlaps to some of the other things that I talked about um, with the uh, reactive to proactive. Um, but one of the things that we're trying to shift that negative to positive with is um, giving the information about accessibility, focusing it more on why it's important and less about the, the legal side of it. 
um, you know, explaining the visible and invisible, invisible disabilities and the features that those students might need, um, showing how students use the assistive technology. That's something that CIDI has been doing at kickoff um, to kind of better understand, well, why do I have to do this? Well, the, because the screen reader is going to read it this way. Um, and also by creating those tutorials and resources specifically designed for faculty and librarians to make the uh, who are making accessible OER, they're they're uh, specifically for that audience, and um, they're more they're delivered in plain English. So it's not so it's not about trying to make everyone an accessibility expert. It's about giving you the tools you need to make that good faith effort. And so that's that's what we're doing. Um, that was kind of an abrupt end, <laughs> but um, but that's that's kind of what we're doing at ALG um, with accessibility, uh, changes that we're making, um, and the support that we're trying to add in. Um, so, if uh, does anyone have questions or? Hi, I'm joining back in. It's Joy. Yes. Yes, if anyone has any questions, you can go ahead and add them to the chat. Um, or you can unmute yourself if you would like and ask your question that way. Are there any things that, um, let's see. Oh, that's Dina. Um, I was going to ask a question. Are there any things in accessibility now as far as educational materials that you think are just should be done, you know, like as a baseline? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, there are things with there are um, pieces of accessibility like heading structure um that have that that are beneficial beyond just the accessibility side of it they actually can using like heading structure in word can actually um create um like interactive tables of contents and um the, helps the actual the writer the the writer of the document actually stay organized as well um, so there are a lot of sort of connections between those things that are both good for accessibility and just good for you in general. Um, but I think at the baseline, I mean, captions, definitely, um, headings, list structure, like using the actual bullet points instead of like dashes, um, like sometimes we can be tempted to do, um, it, uh, descriptive links instead of putting the URL into the document, um, highlighting some actual text and putting linking to that text. Um, I mean, a lot of these things, uh, I guess things, uh, alternative text is um, important for screen readers, but also um, including that information as like an image caption is beneficial to everyone, kind of helps them get what they need out of the image. Um, so a lot of these things are, to me, I mean, I think to most people concerned about this are going to be baseline accessibility. And those are the things we're going to be looking for in the grants now. Okay, thank you. I know a lot of the folks that we have on the call are, you know, obviously they are librarians, some of which may be instructional designers but when we when usg had all of its courses to go online i think that created some challenges for professors or instructors on not only bringing the content online but also making sure that it was accessible are there and i know that jeff was involved in some of the work and maybe you also Tiffany uh, with providing materials for universities on just how to get this done. What were some of the challenges that you saw 
and that, you know, and sort of answers to mitigating some of those challenges, especially for a population that's not the instructor, for example, uh, like our librarian, some of which may be. Uh, Joy, are you talking about um, the kind of move to emergency online instruction? Yeah, I kind of want to see, you know, because it, it feels like we were sort of thrust into uh, online instruction for some folks. And, you know, Galileo has always been a virtual library, but for some institutions and some faculty, it was a very new thing for them to say, OK, this is what I have to do. And then who do they turn to? You know, they turn to instructional designers, they turn to librarians, they turn to their um, if they have, you know, a, a robust IT staff. And so I'm kind of wondering if you saw any challenges with making materials available and accessible as people were going online. Um, well, from the uh, designing keep teaching usg page perspective oh, i've got some echo going on here um we didn't really see too much uh when it came to questions and feedback uh other than the kind of hot button topics that were happening in the news at the moment uh through the contact us form i think a lot of these questions probably happened on campus and if anybody experienced that kind of accessibility issue during uh, the transition to COVID-19 who's here, if you could share that in the chat, that would really help out. Um, one thing that we have heard from our champions and coordinators is that there are, uh, there's a bit of online instruction training that people got from doing a textbook transformation grant and doing, uh, uh, doing OER work in general that prepared them for this move more quickly than someone who had to suddenly move to any kind of online instruction. Um, I would hope that accessibility was in the same boat uh, with that training and with the resources that we now have available. Um, Tiffany, have you heard anything about uh, accessibility in COVID-19 um, in terms of our schools? Um, not as much on accessibility, um, but there was a lot of, so when in the emergency shift, um, most, I think, as far as I uh, saw, most of the faculty were less looking for like new open materials to be using because they all had established textbooks that they were already using in their courses for the semester. Um, and they already had established uh, PowerPoint presentations and things. Um, but what we did see was um, the occasional request for something to replace maybe a module or a lesson that they left in their office um, and couldn't get access to again. Um, and so it wasn't as much like trying to make things accessible. It was more about trying to make sure that they had what they needed to teach. Um, I think that this, I think over the last couple of weeks, um, people were working a little bit more to really change their class. Whereas in that um, emergency shift, it was, re it was really just like, okay, what do we need to do to get by? Um, so yeah, I, I, I really don't, I haven't seen a lot of um, accessibility issues specifically with this emergency shift, I think people are a little bit more um, understanding in all of this too. Um, you know, I think that people are being patient, um, but I, I, yeah, that, that's what I've seen. Uh, I think that there is probably more to say at the institutions though. Yeah, I mean, and speaking on that, you know, more as far as more to say at the institutions, I always wonder, you know, how does someone who could be considered to be a third party to the classroom instruction, you know, we believe librarians are, you know, very critical to education and instruction. But, you know, even in some of the courses that I took at a university in our system, uh, you know, I think they barely, sometimes they didn't even mention that there was a library and that and that there was Gale and you did have access to these sort of materials. So, and then, and then to require that they also be accessible. How would you say that 
librarians and uh, media specialists can help start a conversation that may not have been started before in the way of accessible materials. So how do you think they would be able to, um, as someone who may be seen as a third party, to get buy-in, to begin conversations with higher-ups who are more in control over something that's happening department-wide, for example. With textbook transformation grants, we just recently started the department scaling part of the grants, but how do, how do we make that something that is just what's done? I think part of that is the um, that sort of emphasis on students um, and I guess the emphasis on all students. Um, I mean, one of the things that I saw when I was when I was still at KSU, um, we changed. We tried to change um, the way that people looked at captioning um, by calling attention to how uh, how many like of the how, how many people in the newer generations that just use captioning in everyday life um, and ha like I guess the effect it has on their ability to focus on what they're watching. And so I think um, trying to draw attention to those things, like focusing um, more on how the accessibility affects everyone. And I mean, the, how it affects the students with disabilities is really important, but I think that calling attention to how it affects everyone will help bring that buy-in because right now there's still very much um, there's still very much the narrative that well if the student is disabled then it's up to disability services to do this it's not my problem mm -hmm. and so I think that if we can make those connections and try to pull it make make accessibility less of a disabilities word and more of a accessibility word um, it can uh, bring more of that buy-in in, um, and less of that focus on disability services. Okay, thanks for answering that. We did have one question, and I know that you did um, um, answer it in the chat, but if you could answer it out loud from Alicia, she said, do you have a suggestion for a screen reader to try out? Yeah, so I put a link in the chat. Um, so for Windows, um, NVDA is a free screen reader. Um, the website's just nvaccess.org. Um, and then Jeff put in um, the link to uh, Apple's version. Vision accessibility is built into Mac OS. Um, and so you can find that um, also on the Apple website, information about that, but it is built into the Mac. So um, both of them can be um, a little daunting to get used to if you've never used a screen reader before. Um, it definitely takes a lot of, um, I guess, practice and playing with to understand. Um, but as you play with those, kind of keep in mind that the students who are using screen readers are already fairly comfortable with them and know, know what they're doing with them. So while something may seem a little confusing to you and like not know, you may not know how to do certain things with the screen reader. Um, your students most likely do if they're using it. Okay, thank you. Um, looks like Michael had a question. Is there or can you provide an example of a document before and after accessibility standards have been applied? Uh, yeah, I can. Um, I don't have them posted. Oh wait, Jeff has given something. Um, Jeff has pointed out the differences between public speaking's first and fourth editions. Um, I can also give you the differences between um, open technical communications first, and I guess we're in like a third or fourth edition too. Um, it, if you look at some of the um, earlier grants and some of the first versions of them, um, the ones that have been updated, most of those have more of the accessibility components added to them. Um, but yeah, yeah just pointed out. 
Yeah, we can add those um, links to what you're talking about when I send out the um, the wrap up email afterwards to all the attendees. So they'll be able to have it in their email. So thanks. Uh, that was a great question. See if there are any other questions from anyone. Feel free to put them in the chat. Um, Jeff did add a link to Manifold's Exploring Public Speaking textbook. If you all want to check that out, that's over in OpenALG, where I think you all have seven or eight proof of concepts there. Is that correct? Yes, and um, Tiffany has been working on a template and a guide that will help um, future textbook creators, particularly our grantees, in creating manifold ready textbooks. They use that accessible header structure to completely structure the text as a web readable textbook as well. OK, great, thank you. Well, I don't see any additional questions coming into the chat, and I think um, I've gotten my questions answered as well. Um, if there are any additional things that you all wanted to say as we wrap up here, um, go ahead and do so. If not, we will um, we'll, we'll go ahead and end the session. Is there anything you'd like to say as a close? Um, uh, thanks for joining us. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I just say. And great presenting to you. I hope you do more accessibility. <laughs> yeah, I just say, um, you know, don't be afraid of uh, moving into accessibility's best practices. You can you can be as bold as you want. Uh, nobody's going to stop you. All right, and with that, I think that was a great way to end, Jeff. Thanks to everyone for coming to this webinar today. And thank you both to Tiffany and Jeff for bringing this presentation to everyone. Like I said earlier, it will be available in a recording and for you all to view later. Thank you all so much. Have a good afternoon. Thank you. Thank you very much.